this year, I was watching a news story about a young autistic man named Connor and an encounter with a police officer that happened here in Arizona. The police officer was a trained drug recognition expert and he suspected that Connor, who was hanging out in a park, was doing drugs because he saw Connor twirling something in his fingers and then bringing it up to his face as if to smell it. The officer confronted him and said to Connor, what are you doing? And Connor said, I'm stimming. The officer was clearly confused, did not know what that was, and said to Connor, what's that in your hand? It's a piece of string, Connor said. Connor started to walk away. With that, the officer grabbed Connor's hands, restrained them behind his back, and pushed him to the ground. <coughs> Connor started to panic, and it's absolutely heart-wrenching to listen to him on video. He starts telling himself, I'm okay, I'm okay, and breathe, as if trying to calm himself down. In the meantime, the officers were straining him on the ground and yelling at him to be still and to be calm. Connor continues to scream, I need help. Why are you doing this? Am I going to go away? With that, Connor's caregiver comes running up to the police officer and explains to him that Connor has autism and that stimming is a sensory behavior that calms the nervous system. As a result of this incident, Connor sustained a number of physical injuries, but perhaps even worse, was the emotional trauma he suffered, getting into trouble with a policeman unnecessarily when he's been taught to access police for safety. Connor is pretty significantly impacted by his autism. He has limited speech, and he has trouble communicating and relating, especially in unfamiliar situations. Unfortunately, what happened to Connor is all too common in today's society. Because the behavior and the presentation of autistic individuals is not well understood, they often get into trouble unnecessarily. And even though there's greater awareness in our society about autism, the general public is not very well informed, not only what autism is, but what it looks like, and the wide variety of expressions it can take across the population. This is Russell. I met Russell about a year ago. I was sitting by myself in a hotel room, gathering my thoughts for a televised interview that was about to happen. All of a sudden, in the hallway, there was a huge commotion. I got up to go see what was going on, and as I opened the door, laying at my feet, was this grown man, curled up in the fetal position, crying, trembling, and shaking. I realized that I was looking at Russell. As we tried to calm him down, I learned more about who Russell is. Russell is an internationally acclaimed motivational speaker. He's an author and a poet. He also can become completely overwhelmed by his environment and situations in which he finds himself. We would commonly refer to Russell as high functioning. That's a term that's used to categorize a specific set of symptoms or presentation of autism. Because Russell is a great communicator, he can take care of his own needs, and he does not have an intellectual disability, how his autism impacts him is difficult to grasp because largely his autism is invisible. High functioning individuals, they do have a lot of needs. They're just difficult to detect. They can become overwhelmed by their environments. They have a lot of sensory sensitivity. And unfortunately, they get into trouble a lot and they don't have their needs met because the assumption is, because it's not obvious, the needs don't exist. So we now have this growing population of young adults with varying levels of functioning, like Connor and Russell, living in our communities whose needs are misunderstood and ignored. A lot of these individuals struggle in areas that are very difficult to detect. So for example, somebody like Russell or a high-functioning individual will struggle to connect with people because they don't understand how to initiate those interactions. It has to be taught. They struggle to integrate into their communities because it's difficult to find matching interests and areas of interest and just deal with, with groups and all the social norms that we expect. They have challenges developing meaningful long-term friendships because the rules of social engagement are so foreign to them and they have trouble accessing the support that they need. I've been working in the autism industry for three decades, first as a therapist working directly with kids, and then as the co-founder of a large service company that provided services to kids with autism. I was incredibly proud of the work we did and the impact we had on thousands of lives, but we had focused on children. After selling my company, I started meeting and interacting with more and more adults on the spectrum. And I started to ask a lot of questions. 
What stunned me was the rabbit hole I went down as I started to learn just how much adults were struggling to live their lives. What became clear to me was that despite the efforts of a well-intentioned clinical community, the intensive work that we were doing with kids was not necessarily translating into meaningful and fulfilled adult lives. And for high-functioning individuals, it's even worse. Because their needs are often not obvious, they're kind of left out on the cold to navigate this transition into adulthood themselves, something that their parents have to navigate with them, often for the rest of their parents' life. So this is the result of a system that is focused on children and not a system that really thinks about what are we giving kids so that they can transition into adulthood in a meaningful way. We can't assume as practitioners and as service providers that the work we're doing with kids becomes meaningful in adulthood and that the tools we're outfitting with them with actually become meaningful in adulthood. So it's really crucial to understand that if you work with an autistic child, you're working with the adult that they will become. The prevalence of autism has increased dramatically in the last two decades and it continues to grow as our understanding of the disorder evolves and as the defining characteristics and requirements for diagnosis are modified and revised. 30 years ago, one in two and a half thousand kids were diagnosed with autism. Today, that number sits at close to one in 45, meaning that two and a half percent of our population is on the autism spectrum. And with this growth, we now have 50,000 autistic teens maturing into adulthood every year, and this number continues to grow. Many of these are ill-equipped to live independently, to find and maintain jobs, and to develop meaningful long-term personal relationships. And what's even more alarming is the recent research that shows that suicide rates in this population are up, with adults, autistic adults, being nine times more likely than the general population to contemplate or have attempted suicide, and kids being 28 times more likely to have suicidal thoughts than the general population. When I started working in the industry three decades ago, the driving question that drove our research and our intervention was, what makes autistic kids normal? The goal of services was to provide enough skills and tools to kids so that if you looked at a bunch of kids on the playground, they were indistinguishable from their peers. Many companies today still promote this promise of recovery and sell this idea to parents. But autism is a developmental disorder. It's lifelong, and even though significant gains can be made through intervention, it does not go away. And as many autistic adults have said to me in the last few years that I've been interviewing them, what gives me the right as a professional to decide to want to cure somebody from their autism? Something that is core to their identity and how they've known themselves from the time they were born. So we really need to be rethinking how we're approaching this population and the work that we do with them. Instead of asking what makes kids normal, we should be asking what will help this person live a fulfilled life? Because who gets to decide what makes a meaningful life? Is it me, the professional? Is it the service provider? It's the individual themselves. They should be able to decide where they want to live, who they want to spend their time with, and what they want to do every day. There's a great example of this concept of turning our idea of normal upside down. This beautiful documentary, Life Animated, tells the story, the real life story of a family on their journey with autism. In this documentary, we see two-year-old little Owen, who loves Disney, playing make-believe with his dad. Owen is Peter Pan, his dad is Captain Hook, and they're sword fighting and wrestling and tackling each other in the crunchy leaves on the ground in the autumn. All of a sudden, they describe Owen, at the age of three, starting to disappear into himself. He loses his ability to speak, he stops making eye contact, and he does not respond to his name when he's called. His parents describe watching home movies as if looking to the clues for a kidnapping. Where did Owen go? Ultimately, his parents received the diagnosis of autism. And being that this is the early 90s, their only reference for this is the movie Rain Man, which came out in the late 80s, which was the portrayal of a man so severely impacted by his autism that he could not live in society. So his parents are devastated because the doctors leave them with little hope for Owen's future. After four years of barely speaking, Owen runs into the kitchen one day 
and says about his big brother, Walt does not want to grow up like Mowgli and Peter Pan. Owen's parents are dumbfounded. In the last four years, Owen has said a word here or there, but he's never come out with a 10, 11 word sentence and a sentence with insight about his brother. Owen's dad grabs the puppet Yago from the movie Aladdin and he runs into Owen's room, covers his head with the bedspread and he says to Owen in Yago's voice, Owen, what's it like to be you? And Owen says, not so good. And him and his dad proceed to have the first conversation they've ever had in seven years of Owen's life. What Owen's parents realize is that his obsession with Disney and his repeated watching of these movies is his link to the outside world. Owen is taking stories and movies and plots and understanding his world through the eyes of Disney. So his parents start conversing with Owen in Disney dialogue. Now kids with autism, adults with autism, have restricted interests. It's one of the characteristics of autism. As professionals, we try to eliminate each restricted interest because we deem them to be inappropriate. What's so beautiful in this example of Owen and his family is that they took his restricted interest and his love for Disney and created a link to the outside world. And they used Disney and Disney stories to teach Owen about life. Today, Owen's an adult, he's graduated high school, he lives in his own apartment, he works part-time, and he's even spoken publicly about his experiences. In addition, he runs an adult support group where adults with autism get together and they talk about life through Disney. So when we look at an example like this and we shift our minds away from this idea of pushing people towards normalization and instead we assess who they are, what their uniqueness is and how it impacts their life, we can think about autism differently and so much more becomes possible. To do that, let's take a look at the autism spectrum in the way it's currently viewed. This is how the autism spectrum is currently thought of. It's a linear spectrum from high functioning to low functioning. The lower functioning you are, the more impacted your life is by your autism. The more to the right of the spectrum you would fit. Typically, individuals on the very low end have intellectual disabilities and have multiple domains of functioning that are impacted. For individuals on the high end of the spectrum, because they're good communicators and they don't have an intellectual disability, their needs are dismissed and ignored. But if you talk to individuals on this end of the spectrum, they do have a lot of needs. They become overwhelmed easily. They become confused easily. And things that, for you and I, are typical, are very exhausting. For example, if we're making eye contact, we're not really thinking about it. You're looking at somebody's eyes, you're looking at somebody's face, and you're having a conversation. For autistic individuals, eye contact can be physically painful and very uncomfortable. And once we're in a conversation, I'm not really thinking and you're not really thinking about how I'm interpreting your facial cues and your body language. It's something that we do subconsciously. But for individuals on the spectrum, facial cues don't make any sense. So they're looking at your face and trying to understand how does your expression match the words that are coming out of your mouth. At the same time, they have to filter out all the external noise so they can hear what you're saying and they have to plan a response that is going to be deemed socially appropriate. So it's exhausting and it's overwhelming. And that's why many high functioning individuals spend a lot of time alone and they avoid things like going to college or taking a job, even though they have wonderful contributions to make. So here's a different way of looking at the spectrum. This is a three dimensional construct. And instead of looking at the spectrum along a linear line, we can look at each domain of functioning and where somebody has capacity on that domain and how their functioning fluctuates throughout different situations. So let's look at Russell, for example. Russell is a great communicator. He has good language. He has great motor skills. He's very perceptive and he has good executive functioning skills. He can make good decisions about his life. He's also very sensitive from a sensory perspective. So when he becomes overwhelmed by his environment, as he was that day having to drive through Los Angeles traffic to get to a hotel that was unfamiliar, to be nervous for a televised interview, he became so overwhelmed by his sensory environment that his anxiety became debilitating and took him down. And so to put him on the high functioning end of the scale and say he doesn't have needs because he's high functioning is just wrong, it's just inaccurate. This perspective allows us to look at how traits that are strengths can also become weaknesses in different situations. So what becomes possible 
when we take a different viewpoint and we look at people with the unique strengths and challenges that evolve over time as they grow. Well, we can change the way we approach someone when we meet them or when we think they need help. For example, the mom in the grocery store whose child's having a meltdown or the teenager in the park who's acting strangely. We can educate our emergency response teams about what autism is and what it looks like and most importantly, how to approach someone. There's a very large and growing service provider market in response to the demands for services. It really is time for service providers to change the driving question of intervention away from normalization to how do we really prepare individuals for adulthood? Because we have this growing population of adults that are completely ill-equipped to live in society. This industry has become incredibly attractive to investors. The growth in autism, the recent increase in the availability of funding for services and the relative youth of the industry is very attractive to investors. It's really important for investors to understand the shifting demands of the market. With one in 45 individuals being impacted by autism, everybody in this room, each of you, either knows, works with, or will be related to somebody with autism in your lifetime. And while diagnoses and labels are critical so people can access funding, and get the intervention they need, the danger of labels is that we lose our humanity. When we stop seeing people as three-dimensional individuals and we only see them by their label, like ADD or OCD or autism, we conjure up a lot of negative perceptions and we depersonalize them. And the problem with depersonalizing people is that we judge them, we deny them what they need, and we violate their rights. So I want to remind everybody here to be kind and curious to treat everyone you meet with compassion because you never know the individual struggles people are dealing with. It is the differences in how we think, process information, and perceive our world that makes humanity beautiful. Thank you.